this is Keith's solution to Walter Lewin's problem 192 and it concerns a piece of coaxial cable which I have here um, and I've done an enlarged view of a, 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 a section through it. Uh, we're going to need to use Gauss's law to solve this problem uh, and we make extensive use of symmetry. Without symmetry we can't do the problem. Uh, you can learn all about symmetry in lecture 3 of uh, Walter Lewin uh, of 802 on Walter Lewin's site. So what we have, we have an inner conductor, it's there. We have an outer braid, which is the copper you can see here, and we have a dielectric there. So dielectric, inner and outer. Okay. Right. To make things a little bit easier for me to see the field and what's going on, the electric field, um, I've drawn an end view and I've drawn a section sliced through that way. I'm taking a section somewhere along here, doesn't, doesn't matter where, and I've just chosen a length. We're told that the uh, inner conductor has a radius of RB and that the radius to the outer sheath, the, the inside of the, of the outer braid, sorry, uh, is RA. And we're also told that the, uh, there is a potential from the braid, from ground, uh, uh, call it zero volts, to the inner of one kilovolt. Okay, right, when I take my section, it must be the same everywhere along here. This is a straight piece of coax. Everywhere along must be the same. Um, the fields must be doing the same thing. The only way they can do that is if they're all coming out perpendicular from the inner conductor. So we have axial symmetry, and, and that's the first part of finding the total symmetry. So we're getting there. Um, these are coming out perpendicular to the uh, inner conductor. If we look at the section end on, we can see that if I were to sweep round anywhere from pivoting from the centre, just sweeping round and looking at what the field lines are doing, well, the, the gap is the same everywhere, so there's no way one field line can tell where it is round here. They must all be doing the same thing. So we have radial symmetry. We've got axial symmetry, radial symmetry. That means, put the two together, we have cylindrical symmetry. We don't know the value of this at the moment, and that's going to be crucial. We need to find out what this is doing. But we do know at any radius round here that that value must be uh, some value which I'll call ER to start with. So, if I put, imagine, I've got a surface that looks like a cylinder and I do that with a piece of paper say um, all the charge contained on my little element L of the of the coax cable all the charge must be sending the electric field through the curved surface there can be no electric field coming out of the ends it's all going to be going out through the surface and it's going to be at right angles to the surface. So if I roll the surface out we know that um, ER, our value for E at this radius, is constant everywhere and we know the area of the curved surface. It's simply L times 2 pi R. Um, oh, I've drawn this to scale by the way, I forgot to mention, I'll come back to that later. So I can now use Gauss's law I will consider Gauss's law for uh, the free space condition, so I'm ignoring the dielectric to start with, I'll ignore the dielectric, I'll come back to that at the end, I think it makes the, um, the calculations a little bit easier to follow. So uh, for the free space condition we have from Gauss's law Q over epsilon naught uh, is the surface integral of uh, E dot dA and here uh, the vector uh, dA is simply uh, a small piece of small piece of, of area of, of this curved surface in the direction r hat, which is going to be coming out. Okay, so um, e is we've called it e r, which is a value of, of e at our radius r. The area of the curved surface we've just said is 
2 pi r times l and the contribution from each end is zero. I've just added that in for completeness. So we rearrange and we get a, a vector uh, for er, an expression for, for uh, er in, in the free space condition of q over 2 pi l epsilon naught times 1 over r in the direction r hat. Uh, and note this is a constant, okay? We now need to find the uh, potential. Uh, so what we need to do is, that is the integral from Ra to Rb. We're going from, we're going from there to there, or we're going from here to here. Uh, and um, it is the, the uh, dot product of uh, E, the value of e, e, the vector er dot dr. Before I do that, and I forgot to do it earlier on, just take a look at what the field is doing. We saw, we saw here that the field varies as 1 over r and it's radial. So just for clarity, um, we come here through the conductor, the field is 0, um, it then is a maximum at the edge and it falls off as 1 over r until we get to the inner edge of the braid and then it's zero all the way on. Just, just gives you a, a pictorial idea of what the field is doing and similarly it would be doing the same thing if we did it that way. Okay, back to the calculations. Um, so we need to evaluate um, er dot dr from ra to rb, take the, the minus as well into, into, into consideration, and we get this. Um, just taking this, uh, plugging uh, this into there, we get v equals minus q over 2 pi l epsilon naught, uh, integral ra to rb, standard uh, result, which gives us over here... Uh, a natural log Rb minus natural log Ra uh, in, when we evaluate this. Moving, moving on, we get a potential equals Q over 2 pi L epsilon naught natural log Ra over Rb. Note, we've got our two minuses here, so take care with those. So finally, almost finally, we know that C, uh, the capacitance for the free condition is Q over V. Well, we take our previous expression uh, and simply rearrange. We get 2 pi L epsilon naught over natural log Ra over Rb. So we can now introduce the dielectric and we know that multiplies, the dielectric strength multiplies the capacitance. So it's now 2 pi L epsilon naught kappa over natural log Ra over Rb. Uh, therefore, our first answer is the capacitance per unit length, uh, I've called it C kappa over L, equals 2 pi epsilon naught kappa over natural log Ra over Rb. That's the answer to part, ooh, part A. Plugging in the numbers where, uh, where we've got our dielectric, uh, uh, sorry, our epsilon naught is 8.85 times 10 to the minus 12 and kappa is 2.6. Uh, we know um, the Ra and Rb were given as 9 millimetres and uh, 3.5 millimetres gives us this answer. 153 times 10 to the minus 12 farads per metre. Uh, very quickly, two things to note. That could be 9 metres over 3.5 meters. Um, so it's only the ratio that matters to determine the capacitance per unit length, not uh, the absolute uh, values of the numbers uh, of the dimensions. So here, where I've drawn this to scale, if we really did have a, a dielectric, uh, sorry, a, a coaxial cable that was this size, it would have exactly the same capacitance as the smaller cable which is an interesting observation. Uh, I think it's interesting anyway. And very finally, um, what about the one kilovolt? We were told one kilovolt doesn't matter. We don't need it. The capacitance is not dependent on the voltage we apply to, uh, uh, to the, uh, the inner cable, to the inner conductor. Uh, we've got the capacitance. It doesn't vary. Capacitance does not vary with the... Uh, uh, the voltage we apply. Thank you.